Um, hello, Dimitri. Uh, this is Jim Collins at the Carnegie Endowment, uh, the Russia Eurasia program. Um, could you let our uh, remind me of your title? I am uh, president of the Nixon Center in Washington. That's D. right. Yes, of course. Uh, Dimitri, um, I thought it a good moment to perhaps uh, review the state of play on our relations with Russia. Uh, Secretary Clinton is about to leave for Moscow, and she's going to meet her counterpart, Foreign Minister Lavrov. Uh, there are a large number of things on the agenda, but I just wanted to get your sense for what you think the priorities will be in this discussion. Uh, well, Mr. Ambassador, as you know, uh, Secretary Clinton and Foreign Minister Lavrov uh, both are coordinators of the uh, U.S.-Russian Joint Commission on Cooperation between the two countries. The Commission has a variety of working groups. It is an attempt to give more substance to the U.S.-Russian relationship and to put fairly senior people in charge of making it happen. And uh, this, from what I understand, is the main uh, reason for Secretary Clinton uh, to travel to Moscow. But of course I assume she is going to discuss Iran, uh, possible sanctions, uh, possible pressure on the Iranian regime to display flexibility on uh, nuclear enrichment and inspections. And I assume that Afghanistan will also be a major topic. Foreign Minister Lavrov said already that he wants to discuss the Arab-Israeli peace settlement. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know better than me because one of your former colleagues is in charge of American delegation uh, uh, to discuss uh, follow-up to current agreement on strategic arms reduction talks. The agreement is expiring in December, and they will try to, to find an adequate replacement. Well, that's what I understand, too. I think uh, what I've heard so far is that uh, on that latter question, the negotiations over a treaty to follow up on the existing strategic arms limitation, that our talks are going reasonably well. Uh, they seem to have been given a fair impetus by the meetings between President Obama and President Medvedev in, in July. And I just heard recently from some of the people involved that uh, all in all, people are reasonably satisfied, although there remain some tough issues. And on those, they've mentioned uh, things like uh, the numbers of warheads and the numbers of delivery vehicles that will be uh, dealt with in the treaty or specified in a new treaty. Uh, the relationship between offense and defense is another issue. And uh, so there are some tough issues out there that I think will be uh, brought up by both the two ministers and also the people who are going with them. Now, I also wanted to ask uh, or just mention another. I mean, it seems to me that the broad issue of missile defense and then the issues of nonproliferation are almost certainly going to be discussed. Um, President Obama has given a, a quite significant degree of uh, attention to preventing proliferation of nuclear weapons, and it seems to me that they will be talking about the upcoming meetings on that subject, too. Would you, would you agree? Uh, I would absolutely agree, and these discussions are probably going to be more difficult than discussions regarding strategic arm reductions. As you know, President Medvedev, when he was in New York at the General Assembly, after his meeting with President Obama, Medvedev made a statement which got a lot of attention in the United States and elsewhere. He said that Russia is, in principle, skeptical about economic sanctions, but sometimes sanctions, to use Medvedev's language, are inevitable. Yeah. And the interpretation was, rather optimistic interpretation was, that Medvedev was uh, promising uh, fairly major sanctions against Iran, which Russia would be prepared to support at the UN Security Council. Literally uh, hours after Medvedev's statement, senior Russian officials began to backpedal saying, well, what Medvedev meant, that in principle there may be a moment for sanctions, some kind of sanctions, but Russia is not making any specific commitment. And what is interesting is that uh, 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 since the administration did not want to create an impression uh, that giving up uh, the, the said missile defense site in Central Europe, since they did not want to make an impression that this was a concession to Russia, 
they actually did not discuss with Russia in any detail what Russia would be expected to do in return. So no specific sanctions against Iran were apparently put on the table, and accordingly Russia did not need to respond to specific American ideas on this very important matter. Well, I think I have much the same impression. I, I personally thought that the media around the discussion of Iran in New York and uh, around those statements by President Medvedev really went a bit beyond what it seemed to me had actually been said. And so I think we still have a, a great deal of ground to cover before we're going to be of one mind on Iran and how to approach it. But I do think that the meeting in Geneva recently and uh, the, op the apparent opening to have uh, better inspections of Iranian facilities and so forth may also provide some basis for uh, Washington and Moscow to look at this uh, to find a way to agree on at least some next steps where they can say, well, you know, if nothing else, we all have to ensure that Iran is abiding by its commitments, which it's agreed it has. I, I would hope that at a minimum we'll see some work on that score. And But I agree with you. I think we have a long way to go before we're going to see uh, uh, the American and Russian sides agree on, on sanctions. I think it's that's a tough issue. Uh, Mr. Watts, let me ask you a question. Yeah. Uh, when uh, uh, Secretary Clinton will be in Moscow, everybody assumes that you will see uh, President Medvedev. Mm -hmm. uh, yet, uh, I understand that she is very unlikely to see Prime Minister Vladimir Putin uh, for a very simple reason. She is expected to arrive to Moscow on uh, Monday, uh, uh, October 12th, and uh, to leave Moscow on uh, uh, Monday, uh, sorry, on Wednesday, October 14th, and uh, 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 Prime Minister Putin uh, on the 12th uh, is leaving uh, Moscow for Beijing, and she will be in China till the 15th. So apparently there will be no meeting between the Secretary of State and the Russian Prime Minister. Uh, do you think it is a problem? Do you think that we may, may miss something in terms of Russian decision-making process where uh, Prime Minister Putin plays an important role? Well, frankly, I, I don't think I would say that uh, we have a problem. And, I mean, my own view at the moment on this is that uh, the United States can really only deal with the Russian government as the Russian government. Um, I think it would be a very great mistake to be untransparent uh, to uh, the government as a whole. That is so that both Prime Minister Putin and uh, President Medvedev sort of know what we're doing and what we're about and what we're proposing. Uh, at the same time, uh, it seems to me that if she meets President Medvedev and, of course, her counterpart, um, she will be doing business with people who uh, are leading the country. and. I personally am not of the view that uh, it makes sense for us to assume there's distance between the two leaders, President Medvedev and Prime Minister Putin. Um, even if there is, there's no way that we could possibly understand enough to have it make a difference. Now, I don't think one should uh, in any way uh, ignore a prime minister or, or a president uh, or not pay uh, the right sort of attention, but if he's going to be out of town, well, it didn't work out this time, but uh, President Obama did take pains to see uh, both leaders when he was in Moscow, so I don't think there's any question that uh, we, are, we are not uh, working with the Russian government as a whole and trying to make it very clear that that's how we see our approach. And, of course, several Russian cabinet ministers a part of this uh, uh, commission of course, yes. coordinated by uh, the Secretary of State and the Russian Foreign Minister. So presumably these people who are Putin's subordinates will take part in negotiations with Secretary Clinton. I think that's absolutely right. And uh, one can assume that all will be fully vetted in all quarters. I, I think uh, that, that just has to be our working assumption, and I think that's how it's designed. Uh, let me ask you a question about... Uh, uh, Afghanistan. Yes. Uh, Russia, of course, made uh, what looked, uh, uh, at least superficially, as an important concession, allowing U.S. overflight of, over the Russian territory, 
developing weapons and ammunition to NATO forces in Afghanistan, and uh, uh, all of this is being done free of charge. The United States does not have to compensate Russia. Yet, uh, several days ago, General Viktor Ivanov, uh, who uh, is director of the Russian equivalent of Drug Control Agency, was in Washington and New York, uh, and uh, he had negotiations with U.S. officials, but also in his public performances, including at the Nixon Center, I personally was not present, but my colleagues have shared what he said with me, and apparently he was very critical of the U.S. position, saying that the United States is not prepared uh, uh, to deal uh, with a uh, drug problem in Afghanistan sufficiently aggressively, and most important that the United States is not prepared to attack from the air uh, opium fields, uh, which in his mind would mean that opium production will multiply, uh, that uh, Taliban will have additional financial resources, and of course drug addicts will get uh, uh, more opium and other drugs. What would be your response to that? Well, I guess uh, let me start with the agreement on uh, transshipment first. Uh, which this was an agreement reached by the two presidents, Obama and Medvedev, uh, in July. Uh, where, in essence, the Russian government is facilitating the transit of American support equipment, including what they call lethal equipment, that is, weaponry and, and personnel, uh, to move uh, across Russian territory and other countries' territory in the region to support the troops in Afghanistan. Now, I think that's a very important agreement, and it is one that uh, certainly... I would say, puts uh, the Russian government and the American government, uh, it would seem, on the same side of a strategic question. That is, that no one sees it in anyone's interest to have either the uh, al-Qaeda or the Taliban or the extremists in Afghanistan prevail, and that uh, having the means to prevent that is important to Russia as much as it's important to others. Now, uh, that means that uh, the, the new agreement, which I understand is just in these very days uh, coming into its first implementation uh, after working out all the details of uh, transit and so forth, um, is actually going to be a very significant matter for the American side in supporting our forces in Afghanistan. And uh, in, it's a significant step in supporting a strategic objective. Now, I think uh, what Mr. Ivanov was saying here about narcotics and opium production and so forth is uh, certainly reflective of a very strongly held Russian view. Certainly in my experience in talking with uh, a number of uh, people in Moscow and elsewhere in Russia, the narcotics question from Afghanistan is one of the most burning and difficult issues. Um, if there's anything that the Russian side would hope to see the Americans and the NATO forces undertake, it is a more aggressive and stronger effort to prevent uh, transit of narcotics out of Afghanistan and to curtail production of the, the opium and so forth in that country. Um, I don't think there's any question that this is a high priority for Russia in Afghanistan and regarding Afghanistan. Uh, it probably stands uh, very much uh, close to the, the, the uh, prevention of the spread of radicalism from Afghanistan. And I, I would agree with you that uh, they have been pressing the United States to do more, uh, and they've been pressing NATO to do more, is my understanding of, of what uh, they have done. Now, you know, uh, I assume that this kind of issue is the sort of thing that uh, Secretary Clinton will be hearing about when she talks to Minister Lavrov uh, and uh, in, with others in Moscow. Um, you know, the, the uh, transit agreement on moving equipment and troops to Afghanistan uh, was a step, but I don't think it represents the, the be-all and end-all of what Russia would like to see uh, developed in the way of uh, uh, priorities and objectives for uh, the, the NATO and American forces in that country. If you don't mind, I will ask you just one more sure. question. Uh, it is interesting that when uh, the Russians talk about uh, drugs in Afghanistan, they suggest a more aggressive, if I may so, American position. 
But when they talk about the United States sending more troops, informally at least, every Russian expert, every Russian official or general I was able to talk to says that the United States would make a major mistake engaging in nation building in Afghanistan, uh, uh, that more troops would only alienate uh, the Afghan people and would rub them the wrong way in terms of their nationalist sentiments. And basically the Russians are saying the British have tried it, the Soviets have tried it, and uh, uh, of course uh, nobody learns anything from uh, other nations' mistakes, but the United States would be wise to have fairly modest objectives in Afghanistan. What do you think about that? Well, I've heard very much the same arguments and same points from, from Russian friends and, and uh, colleagues. Um, it seems to me um, at the moment that it's clear there is a major debate going on in Washington, as you know, over what I would say is a definition of the mission for America and I suspect for the NATO forces as well in Afghanistan. Just what is it we are trying to do? What is the minimum that's acceptable as a, a, uh, a successful mission? What are we trying to prevent? What are we trying to end? Now I think it's clear that at a minimum we are unwilling to see Afghanistan return to uh, a playground for the terrorism uh, organizations, Al-Qaeda, and so forth. I think it's equally true that uh, we believe Afghanistan should cease to be a source for major narcotics production. Um, how far this government is now going to define objectives beyond those in terms of what you can call state building or transforming the society and so forth, I think is what's under debate at the moment. And as you know, the, the question is often framed about how many troops should be sent or should uh, President Obama order more troops. I think the real question, or I hope the real question, frankly, being discussed is what is it the troops are being sent to accomplish? And then uh, ask the military, what is it you need in order to accomplish that? I uh, believe that the reason we're having this debate again is that there are some questions about uh, the earlier definition of the mission uh, as to whether it was a feasible one or an adequate one. And I expect over the coming uh, days and weeks we're going to hear more about uh, just what it is we expect to be the minimum we have to accomplish in Afghanistan. I, I think that's an issue. And here I think the Russians weighing in on the side of trying to do something about narcotics is a factor that will be weighed in the balance. Uh, you know, uh, 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 as well as I do, probably better than me, you used to know Yuli Voronsov, uh, who was, of course, uh, former Russian ambassador to Washington and uh, dealt with you a great deal when you were ambassador. Yes, and uh, he was ambassador in Afghanistan. Uh, exactly. That's yeah. what I, uh, I want to refer to. And uh, Voronsov, with whom uh, I worked uh, very closely, he was a member of uh, the Nixon Center Advisory Council, a great wise man. He used to say that uh, uh, in terms of the Soviet involvement in Afghanistan, there were two stages. First stage was to bring Soviet troops into Afghanistan and to remove uh, the Afghan government they found disagreeable. He said it proved to be uh, very easy and fairly non-controversial because most Afghans did not like that government as well. But he said as soon as uh, it became clear that the Soviets were in Afghanistan to stay. He said all kinds of tribes, all kinds of political factions began forgetting about their previous grievances and turned against uh, just uh, uh, the new enemy. And the new enemy, of course, was the Soviet Union. Do you think we are running the same risk uh, in Afghanistan? I think there is indeed a chance that we're running the same risk. And I believe that uh, anyone who is not mindful very much of the experience of others in Afghanistan and the limits of any foreigner's ability to shape that country or to change it is probably going to have a very difficult time uh, learning the lesson. And um, I hope we are going to be wise enough to, to think through the implications of any definition of mission we make 
and also of any idea that we are going to be there permanently or in any significant way for a long time. Uh, I just think Afghanistan has a history of not tolerating that with any any equanimity or any uh, resignation to foreigners running the country. And that, it seems to me, is a significant uh, fact that everyone better bear in mind. So I would agree with you, Dimitri. I think uh, you know that this is a real issue for us, and I personally believe that there are great limits to how far the American military can, in fact, uh, change the realities on the ground in that country uh, without the basic support of the population to help them do it, and that that's going to be a real challenge. Uh, you know, uh, obviously, what uh, we are saying, and we uh, are agreeing with each other on defining mission in Afghanistan very carefully. I uh, can imagine that uh, somebody would instantly say, "Oh, come on, you're engaging in moral equivalence." Uh, we, uh, the Americans, came to Afghanistan with best intentions as liberators. Uh, the United States was attacked first by Al Qaeda on September 11th. Uh, the Soviets had no business being in Afghanistan uh, whatsoever. They were communists, they were supporting uh, evil people, uh, very uh, unpatriotic government as far as most Afghans were concerned. To what extent do you think this kind of differences uh, would uh, uh, kind of uh, eliminate the need uh, to think about Soviet experience as something relevant to us? Well, I think, you know, it's probably uh, a fair point to uh, discuss why different motivations may have been there. But the fact of the matter is if the, if the end product of the actions on the ground in the eyes of uh, Afghan village people and Afghan citizens in small and medium towns is not really seen as different, that is, uh, civilians get killed or we have major problems with uh, local leaders and so forth, I fear that uh, that distinction may not be the most relevant one uh, in the considerations of the people with whom we have to deal. And I think that's a problem. Uh, I think there's no question. Uh, there's, there's, there's certainly no question that having the ability to establish a secure environment is a prerequisite to being able to do pretty much of anything in the way of, if you will, social welfare work, uh, rebuilding, and so forth. And so far, uh, I think we're seeing that that's a very, very difficult thing to accomplish. And so, you know, the means are going to determine in many ways, it seems to me, the perceptions of the people with uh, who are involved in with us or who have to uh, look at the actions we take uh, and make their own judgments about whether it was worth it or not. Uh, when uh, uh, we talk about uh, uh, a new beginning in the U.S.-Russian relationship, we obviously are talking about uh, two actors. Uh, one is the United States, the Obama administration, and I think that uh, most of us, and I don't know whether you would agree with this or not, but most of us believe that President Obama is uh, sincere and serious. Uh, in uh, having a more uh, pragmatic and cooperative relationship with Russia. Oh, I think that's absolutely true. And I think it's very pragmatic as well as uh, a belief that we simply could not go on in the way that we were going, say, a year ago or a year and a half, uh, half a year ago. But what about the Russian side? You and I were together uh, in Moscow uh, in uh, uh, June, I believe. We were talking to Russian officials and uh, to prominent Russian experts, and you know what made me uh, uncomfortable uh, and indeed somewhat upset, as you may remember, that when we, uh, 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 the American delegation, were talking about uh, what needs to be done on the American side to give uh, a new relationship a chance, I did not feel that our Russian counterparts were responding in kind, and actually uh, most of them were saying, well, the United States need to do more need to do something else, and we're saying, well, we, we do know what the United States ne needs to do as far as we are concerned. Tell us what Russia is prepared to do. And I did not have a, a feeling that they had a good answer. Well, I guess I'd, uh, I'd, I'd reflect on that in, in the following way. It seems to me two, two issues that were extremely 
central to creating a great deal of tension and almost uh, overt confrontation have been diffused significantly over the last several months. And I, here I have in mind uh, the, the missile defense decision. How, for whatever reasons it was taken, it's, it's been in many ways been uh, taken off the table as a, a front and center issue. And similarly, the issue of uh, additional uh, nations joining NATO, uh, whether or not it's been permanently removed from the agenda is certainly not at the active forefront of the agenda at this point, either in Georgia or Ukraine. So the, the, uh, to some extent, the framework within which people are beginning to discuss things today or to act uh, is somewhat different from what it was, say, six months ago. Now, I think uh, I could totally agree with you that I thought there was a complete poverty of imagination on the part of our Russian colleagues uh, when we were there just before the summit. I, I was quite disappointed, too, that there, there seemed to be almost no interest in thinking through what might be possible on both sides if uh, there was movement. On the other hand, I'd have to say that uh, compared to, say, six months ago, a number of things do seem to have moved on the Russian side that, uh, if not as trade-offs, at least are moving in parallel with some of the steps that the American side has been taking. And I would here suggest that the Afghan transit agreement was, if not, a, I don't see it as a concession, but it was a kind of agreement that one would have had difficulty imagining getting uh, resolved, say, last December. Um, similarly, it seems to me that the, uh, from everything I've heard, there has been an increasing uh, momentum on the Russian side to push forward with uh, the strategic arms limitation talks, really to get down to business, get this done. Uh, I'm not sure it will get done, but, uh, but the impression of the people I'm talking to who have been involved in it in any way um, is that the Russian side now is very serious about uh, coming to terms on this. Um, I think also uh, there are some other areas in which uh, we've begun to see some change in the Russian approach. And I, here I have in mind, uh, for whatever reason, um, what seems to be a more open and uh, welcoming uh, approach to foreign investors, foreign business. We've just had uh, President Putin inviting some of the key energy companies to, to talk about investing in Yamal uh, oil deposits and gas deposits. Um, I've heard of a number of other major American companies who've, over the last several weeks, uh, had overtures to uh, come and talk in areas that they simply could not break into uh, six months or a year ago. Something's happening. Now, this may be the economic realities that uh, Russia needs technology and investment and so forth to to achieve the goals that people like President Medvedev seem to be laying out. But whatever the reason, it seems that it is now much more uh, open to uh, dealing with American business and American companies than was the case, say, six, eight months ago. So I don't know whether we can say, uh, if we were to have that conversation today with the people we met with uh, before the July summit, uh, we would hear something different from what we heard then. But it seems to me there are certain indicators that uh, the Russian side is more open to talking about or thinking about uh, some closer cooperation in areas that are of interest to them as well as to us. Uh, I completely agree that uh, Moscow uh, seems to be more prepared to talk the talk. Are they more prepared to walk the walk? You mentioned uh, this meeting Prime Minister Putin had with uh, 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 energy companies in Yamal. Mm -hmm. I looked at the terms Putin was uh, proposing them. Uh, uh, Mr. Ambassador, I would be very surprised if there would be many takers. Uh, there was that a lot may of, well be. Uh, yeah, the I, terms, were, the yeah. terms were very unattractive. They were not offered any share uh, in the development. They were not offered any property rights. They essentially were offered to be contractors and they would be expected to deliver the technology which then could be replicated by Russian companies. I was even more alarmed by a recent statement made by Prime Minister Putin 
about uh, Renault. Uh, as you know, this is a major American automobile giant. They're involved in Russia, and they uh, today have uh, a blocking package in one of major Russian uh, car companies. Mm -hmm. So Putin said uh, that uh, Renault needs to invest more in the development of this company. And if Renault would not be prepared to do it, they would issue new shares, uh, and as a result, Renault would lose its blocking package. Yeah. You know, as far as foreign investors are concerned, this is devastating, because it suggests to them that it's very difficult to count on any orderly process uh, when you invest in Russia. Well, Dimitri, don't get me wrong. I'm not sure that any of this is going to pan out. I simply would say that uh, in some ways... Uh, even the idea of having Westerners come in and look at these kinds of projects was not really something people wanted to discuss six, eight months ago. Now, I suspect that uh, companies will be wise enough not to go in for the terms. I also agree that, you know, if um, the terms are such that uh, the Western investment uh, does not feel it gets uh, the, the minimum it needs, they're just not going to go. And I think uh, in that case, the Russian side is deluding itself if it thinks it will get support for, you know, major investment, major technology transfer, unless the, uh, the Western companies are able to satisfy themselves that they'll have an adequate return and an adequate voice in the way their business is going to be conducted. I don't know whether you would agree if we summarize this by saying uh, there is a promising beginning but the real heavy lifting is still ahead of us. I would totally agree with you. I think we've made a pretty good beginning over the last eight months, but I think uh, it's no more than that, and with very few exceptions, it's hard to say that we can point to a specific, tangible, real accomplishment yet that uh, is in some sense a concluded one. Now, if the troops and supplies begin to flow to Afghanistan, I'll say we've reached one success. But that's hardly more than a beginning. So I would agree with you. Mr. Ambassador, it's always a great pleasure talking to you and hope to see you soon. Okay, good to talk to you, Dimitri. Thank you very much. Bye -bye. Thank you.